Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen here with Louis de Souza, and this is your daily dose of happy. We're so happy you decided to join us today, and uh, unfortunately, our friend Amy is in a blackout of all things. I mean, the, the people in Atlanta, they need to get their act together. They're interfering with us being able to do a podcast. I mean, what what, the, what were they thinking, Louis? I mean, this is just not fair to us, but we'll have to get through it. Oh, well. <laughs> hey. Atlanta. Uh, well. Yeah, I'm going to blame it on Atlanta. Everybody else blames stuff on Atlanta these days, so I'm going to blame Atlanta too, right? Because blaming well, is good right? <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, she's... <laughs> I mean, uh, we're talking about law of attraction all the time, eh? That's right, yeah. So why as well attract what, 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 more what things What you put out doesn't come back to you. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> Yeah, what a great policy. You just keep blaming all over the place and then you complain when, you know, the stuff comes back that you don't like and say, well, you know, life is so. Uh, LOA to the LOA changed my life uh, Facebook group. And mm. uh, there's this guy complaining that uh, nobody loves him and, you know, he mm. can't make any friends. And, and then, you know, a lot of people are telling him like I was, you know, focus on yourself, get your relationship between you and you going. And he says, who's the other you? (laughs) (laughs) Great question. (laughs) Very good question. Yes. Yes. It's an excellent question. That's a question we need Um, to ask ourselves more often, actually. It is. It is. And, uh, you know, started explaining bits of it to him and, uh, you know, he didn't get that either. So Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) back to the drawing board completely. And and it's it's important because sometimes you expect a lot of people to be on a certain level and really understand everything. And it's not, it's not always the case. No. Um, and, and then he was saying, people, please stop telling me to, you know, get in tune with myself and all the rest of it. I'm talking about other people. You know? Other people, yeah. It's their <laughs> fault. It's not my fault. Don't, will you please get with the program here? I mean, come on. So, so when we were talking about somebody else's fault just now, this guy immediately popped into my head. It's like, yeah. And I, I wrote back, I said, J- just because you don't like the way we're, we're, we're portraying the, what we found works for us, um, you know, don't, don't think it's not actually the way to go, you know. <laughs> you, you can you can try and bring and force other people to do things, but it really doesn't work very well. <laughs> you can't force somebody up. to like you. Well, do you like me? You know you like me. You're gonna like me. <laughs> there, there are people who are a choice in that. <laughs> very at, they're very good at doing that kind of thing. Of course, they end up paying a very heavy price for it. That's the part that kind of gets left out of the mix. But there are people who will just basically drive themselves into the early grave in order to get you to like them. And and they can often do it. You know, there's there are a lot of people who are just kind of, I don't want to say it in a disparaging way, who who will go along with stuff. Let's put it that way. And so you can kind of gain a sort of superficial like that way if you really, really want to. And people do that. But they pay a pretty heavy price to do it. That's the thing. Well, the thing about that kind of a relationship, Walt, is it's temporal. And it's a lot more oh, yeah. temporal than the other way around. I mean, if if you do it genuinely from an attraction point of view, the right people are coming at the right time and you're playing the right dance and everything's going smoothly and timing and place and people and and all the rest of it. But when you've cajoled, manipulated or pushed and pulled somebody to like you, it never lasts very long. Yeah. And when you say there's a price to pay, it's when it falls apart. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a steep price. It's a very steep price. It's, it's not a coincidence that so many people who become very successful financially find that other areas of their life aren't quite so abundant. I think there's a direct connection that goes on there. Um, part of it is because we have been taught as a society, as individuals and as a society to you know, it's all about the hard work. It's not about the vibration. Vibration, that's just a bunch of woo-woo nonsense. It, the hard work is what makes the difference. And, and those who really apply themselves and who really push the, you know, the hard buttons and become the hardcore operators will, will get to the, the millions. But when they get there, they find that their relationships are in tatters. Their health is falling apart. And then they do what everybody else does. They shake their fists at the universe and say, you know, God, why me? You know, what did I ever do wrong? <laughs> but isn't that true? Yeah. Isn't that the way it often goes with so many people? You know, it's, um, 
I always think it's quite amusing blaming God. They don't even go, no, most people, even I don't even really know what God is. (laughs) Who am I blaming? (laughs) (laughs) What am I blaming? (laughs) There is that too. Yes, that's true. Um, but, uh, it's, it's also about, it, it isn't so much about the God, it's about the blame. That's really what they're trying to do. They want to have a way to, to say, it's not, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's, it, it's the weather or my neighbor or God or it, it, it's, it's not me. I know that it's not me. <laughs> it's anybody but me, right? <laughs> You know, I come across very few people like that anymore. I just, I just don't attract them. But, you know, you, you, hear, you hear stories from my wife who works with a whole lot of people, and you know, mm. in a nursing home. And, yeah. you know, you, you hear the stories, third party and second party and all the rest of it. And it's really interesting. Like, people still think like that. They still blame other people. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> this is really interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, when you've been kind of withdrawing yourself from it by not attracting it, you kind of forget after a while. That's you do. You do. Left it's, behind. Not, so it's not an active vibration anymore, so it's just, right. it's just gone. Yeah. And it's really interesting how the people start, the different people start being drawn to you and how others vanish once you start changing in your life. Um, that, that's one of the strangest – well, it is noticeable, but it's also a really strange um, experience as it happens. And I say that because it's almost like at one point in time, you're, 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 you've got your, your original mindset, your default mindset that you've been living with all this time. You start to make a shift in your mindset. At first, nothing seems to happen. And then stuff does seem to happen. And you say, wait a minute, what just happened? Something shifted here. You don't even know what it is at first is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah and then you, yeah, then yeah. you start identifying, Oh, people are treating me differently. Why are people treating me differently? What is it something I said? I'm, you don't begin. It takes a while before you finally make the connection that says, oh, it was my thoughts. It was my thought yeah. pattern. I changed the thought pattern and I'm getting different results and getting different experiences, different responses from other people. And on top of that, as I'm learning, as I learn to change my own response, it kind of accelerates. It becomes, you know, like that, the vortex that Abraham talks about. It just kind of, it, it starts to accelerate and, and kind of morph over at a faster rate. And it can be a little disorienting, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's a disorienting experience until you get used to it. And as, I think as it's why it's so, in- well, it's, I think it's also why it's so easy to overlook it. We, because yeah. early on, I find it's really, really easy to just fail to notice the changes that have happened. I think it's tied into the fact that, that it, it, it does shift. It, it's kind of a, it's subtle at first. And then after it happens, you feel like a, like the magician just waved his wand and like, what just happened? Something happened here. What just happened? So when you come in contact with your higher self and you start aligning yourself more with it, it is so, different to how you were mm. that you really you can wake up and look at yourself in the mirror in the morning and say who the hell's that you know yeah yeah exactly it, it's exactly there, there's so many changes going on and it physically your face changes your yeah your, your look changes your wrinkles go your health improves you know <laughs> everything starts changing and it's like wow <laughs> this is really really and it can be quite scary um it, it can be Quite shocking to go from this reality, yes. have it so shaken up and go to that reality. And then, of course, you, you tend to those active vibrations, you tend to go back to them. So mm. there's there's that aspect of getting pulled back into the old vibe and the old way of thinking and doing things. And uh, yeah, so it's a little bit of a becomes, tennis game that we play. We, we end up we, we, we go there, we get to the, the full extreme we want, and then we kind of slide back yeah. and then we go back. It's like, you know, accordion almost back and forth, back and forth. And, uh, you know, it's a very, it, it, the old word I used to use, it is the spiritual process. It is the mm. expansion of who you are and it is what it is. And we're not taught it at school. Um, there's not too much information on it, how to handle it, what, what happens. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as I like mentioning, I think on the last three shows, is um, Carolyn May says we're we're mystics without monasteries, and you know, 
Mm. It, it really is difficult to go to your boss and say, you know, I'm having, <laughs> I'm having a spiritual crisis. Can I take right. off a week, please? Yes. You know? <laughs> and, you know, it, it really does happen to a lot of people now. And, uh, first of all, a lot of people don't even know that this is what's happening. Yep. Um, and if they do start picking up the different pieces of it, then it's how do you integrate it into your physical, yeah. practical, down to earth family and life? And, it can be really challenging. Um, now, it can also yeah. be fun, to be perfectly honest. There is that other side of it, too, because you mentioned wrinkles specifically, so I'll go to wrinkles. Just, <laughs> just three or four years ago, I had a lot more wrinkles than I have now. I haven't succeeded yet with the, the darkening of the hair. I, I haven't quite figured that part out yet. But but no, the wrinkles I, I, the wrinkles are definitely a lot less than they used to be, and I, oh, I find that to be pretty cool. <laughs> it, it is amazing, Walt. I mean... What is going on in your mind starts manifesting physically. Mm. And those wrinkles manifested because you had a lot of thoughts of what you didn't want. Oh, yeah. And as you've got more thoughts of what you do want, the wrinkles vanish. And mm. it's the way it works. Yeah. And in, I'm, I'm a bit uh, peeved off with StreamYard because I can see the gray hair now. <laughs> 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 With, where uh, Zoom did a very, very good job did a nice of, of making yeah, my hair true. look black. <laughs> I'll put it in a complaint to them about that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's all their fault anyway. <laughs> That's right. I prefer the Chinese software. <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese software, right. <laughs> Well, actually, StreamYard may be Chinese too. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure where StreamYard is made, but um, well, it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't really. Because but, because um, when you blame somebody, it doesn't really matter where they come from. So it just doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's all their fault. <laughs> it's all their fault. <laughs> I've now had to go buy a green screen. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'll have my background back. I'll have my beach back <laughs> next week. <laughs> yeah, we had, a, um, we had a, a whole big reason to blame StreamYard today because it, StreamYard has a, a couple of wonderful features, including the ability to broadcast to multiple locations, which is why we're we're giving it a shot and we're probably going to expand on it. But uh, to be honest, guys, you do need to work on the green screen a little bit. Uh, your competitor over at Zoom, they definitely have it down pat. You don't. So work on that one, you know. But um, <laughs> if you don't work on it, we're going to start guilting you. And then... <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess we're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's fun to laugh at it, though. Oh. Oh, well, it's so much better than actually getting upset, you know, because cause that was the old pattern, right? Getting getting upset. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Now you not only can joke about it, you know, you, you, you're just having fun with it. You, you're yeah. just knowing that this is the old patterns that you used to play with. Let's play with them and show people on Alloway today that this is how it used to be and this right. is where we are now. Exactly. And, you know, the contrast is what teaches. So, you know, play with it. You know, it was interesting. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking to my, my sister and, um, what Ingrid has done is she's left living in the Netherlands and she's gone to Mozambique. Oh to live in literally a tiny little shack wow. and they've been going there for years now and they've, they've cultivated the land and they've, they've, they've used permaculture, not permaculture. They've used some, some understanding of how to get the soil to the best quality and they're growing all these trees and stuff. And, um, it's just fascinating that they've literally packed up their entire life in Europe and gone to live in, at, at her age in Mozambique. Yeah. Uh, in, in literally a shack. <laughs> That's really wild. And, uh, you know, I've got so much admiration for her. And, you know, one of my sisters was speaking to my other sister and they were saying, Oh, where was Louis this podcast? And I was like, Oh, they both watched my podcast. Like, hi, sisters. <laughs> Welcome um, to LOA today, actually. You yeah. Know? <laughs> Let's have some comments. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it, it's, it's just really great, uh, to, to, at that stage of your life to have such a drastic radical change. Mm. And, you know, yeah. they, they've got the land now. They've got permission from the, the local chief to live there and all the rest of it and, mm -hmm. and develop mm -hmm. it and help, help, you know, anybody and everyone they can. So yeah, um, 
I'm really excited to see where they go step by step from where Absolutely. they are because I can see it growing and changing. I mean, literally, it's it's right near the coast. <clears throat> um, and, you know, they've got a beautiful view uh, and all the rest of it. And it's just really, it's, it's quite interesting because it's, and it's remote. It's quite remote. Um, to get there, you almost need a four by four. Um, <laughs> you probably do. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds cool. Uh, that sounds and really and cool. it's a, it's a really different world in Mozambique. I don't know if you know the whole history, but, um, there was, I there's don't been really know much war, about it, no. internal war in that country forever. I mean, we, mm. we were, you know, it's the closest beach to where I used to live in South Africa and mm -hmm. we only went, well, no, we didn't even go there that once. We got stopped at the border because my mom forgot her passport and we had to go all the way back. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, my, my sister's also, you know, Biggin Tabor and Hicks and LOA and all the rest of it. So, mm. um, you know, she, she's been able to manifest lots of things in her life. And uh, mm. that's just one of the, the more interesting ones that I think is so cool. So, that's so very cool. cool. Hey, I got a story to tell you, actually. Um, I've been telling people about the progress that my wife is making in terms of getting off her thyroid medication that she's been on for the last two and a half oh, yes. years. After being told numerous times by her endocrinologist that, uh, she was going to be on it for life. Um, as of about, so 10 months ago, she had gotten it down. They were, they were starting to reduce it. And then about six months ago, they reduced it some more. And then about three months ago, they got it down to the lowest dosage that she could take on a daily basis. And then six weeks ago, they told her to start doing it every other day for the next four weeks, I think it was, and then to go off it entirely for two weeks and get her blood checked. And so that's where she's at right now. She got her blood work checked and it looks like everything is normal. We haven't heard anything from the doctor, but the, you know, the results that you can see online say everything's within the normal range. So that's pretty cool that she was able to manifest that. But there was also, I don't know how to describe, how, how I would um, label what happened. Like it, it wasn't really a setback because it didn't last long enough to be a setback, but it could have been a setback. Let's put it that way. Because yesterday she was experiencing um, soreness in her throat where the thyroid would be. Um, she was experiencing high levels of, of uh, pulse rate. I mean, her pulse is normally in, in the 60s range and, and it was in the 80s and 90s. Um, she has a history of um, uh, atrial fibrillation, AFib. And so we were wondering if it might be that, but... We had an app that tests pulse and we, after a few tests, we were pretty sure she wasn't actually an AFib, although we weren't a hundred percent sure of that. But nevertheless, she was, she was really feeling out of sorts. It was the same kind of thing that we had experienced before that had led to her diagnosis. And so we're thinking, well, okay, this isn't good. What do we do about it? It's a Sunday. So you really can't go to a doctor's office. Um, and so she said, well, can you do some of your magic? And what she meant by that is, um, I once got a hold of one page out of a Reiki manual. I don't even remember where it came from. I think she actually got it from somewhere. She handed it to me. She said, can you make any head or tail out of this? And I read it and I said, yeah, I guess I understand what they're saying. And so we tried it out and we've been able to use it on various occasions to help her get rid of migraine headaches and things like that. And so she said, can you, can you do some of your magic and see if you can get rid of this? I said, yeah, sure. Let's try it. So. Um, we had to lay down and I started doing it. And basically all I'm really doing is, uh, first of all, I've learned just through experimenting with this thing that I can detect energy pools around her body within like an inch or two of her skin just by holding my left hand there. I can feel it in my palm. So I've gotten pretty consistent. I, I can always tell where the energy is kind of dammed up and pooled up. And so all that that one page in the manual taught me was sweep it away. So that's what I do. I sweep it away. <laughs> I have no other idea of what to do other than that, but I'm doing that much. So I started sweeping it away. And uh, of course, you know, when it was on the Where neck, in the body was it? it was, well, there were three of them, actually. One yeah, where was on, on her upper forehead near the crown of her head. Just one, point to it? Uh, right, right up here. Okay. Like, yeah. Like forward of the crown, right? Yeah. And a second one was on the side of, of her neck and, and she mm -hmm. was um, swollen there too. You could tell the thyroid was swollen. And the third one was on her shoulder. And I don't know what that was all about. And she didn't know what that was all about, but there were three of them. Can, can you just turn and just show me on the shoulder exactly where? 
it, it was like the back part of the, the shoulder. Is, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's right back there. And so I just worked on sleeping them away. And I, it was really strange too, because it was, I, I could feel that the energy that I was sleeping away was sticking to my hands. I had to mm -hmm. do a lot of stopping to like shake it flicking, off and flicking, yeah, shaking flicking it off, off. Or, or, or just rubbing it off was often more mm -hmm. effective. It was like, it was really thick. So I did that for a bit and I'd go back and, and do some more sleeping away and it would, it would just collect again. And it, it was kind of like dealing with perpetual static cling. <laughs> That's <laughs> what it felt like. <laughs> so anyway, just kept doing that and doing that. And finally, I normally I, I keep going with whatever. You know, if it's a migraine, for instance, until I get rid of the energy pools entirely, I couldn't get rid of them entirely. I got rid of like 80 to 90 percent of the energy that was there. And so I said, well, I don't know. I, that seems to be about the best I can do. She says, OK, that's fine. So she took a nap, woke up about two hours later and said, I feel great. I said, how's the swelling on your neck? She says, it's gone. Have you taken your pulse? No, so I'll take your pulse. So she used the, the app to take her pulse. It was back in the 60s again. I said. Wow, this is pretty is cool. Amazing. This so, is cool. I like this. I don't know what I did, but <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so, do you, do you appreciate the woo woo clarity that you are able to perceive energy? Yes, yes, and, it, and it, okay. it's real. It's tangible. I can feel it. It's it's not. Yep. It, it's not something I'm half imagining. It's like, oh, geez, get that thing off my hand. That's what Absolutely. it is. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a very, very, very important step in, in, in the process. And, you know, in the beginning when I held two points on my leg and warts that had been there for two years and one had been cut up by a doctor but just grew straight back within a mm -hmm. week, vanished, you know. Nice. That was my first experience of, my Gosh, the stuff is good, effective, <laughs> and it does what it says in the manual. It says right, right, right. <laughs> the manual actually worked. Oh my god! <laughs> um, and you know, it, it's 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 a journey because you know, when I was younger, I always wanted to understand energy and feel it, and mm. I went on a psychic healing course. Okay, but the guy was very good, Yonder Fries, and. Um, mm -hmm. He said, by the end of the weekend, you will understand energy. And by the end of the weekend, I did not understand energy and I was peeved. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I would be too, actually. <laughs> so I spent years after that trying to understand energy in different ways and different levels and different things, but I wasn't getting there. I wasn't getting there. And it was really annoying because I'm one of these people who really feel this is my... Mm my my reason for being is to understand the, the non-physical to to large and larger degree and it really really frustrated me and, and it slowed me down so you know you've heard me speak about it and you've heard astrid speak about it etc so you get you get to the place where you can feel more confident in, in even looking in that direction you know, and more people that are listening to this podcast are, you know, getting into that place maybe who, who know energy, but better and know it well or whatever. And, and you can get to know it even better and better and better. And you can start sensing things. You know, I'm always saying to my wife, driving along in the car and I say, Oh, you know, I bet you it's full moon. She says, of course it is. Look, it's over there. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and you and, and she knows why I know it's full moon mm. because I hear that buzzing in my head every full moon. Mm. It's just, it's just the same kind of buzzing I get in deep meditation and, and, and near out of body experience, et cetera. It's the same, it's a similar kind of buzzing. That's why they often say if you want to do out of body experiences, try to do it around full moon. And it is, there's an advantage to it. They're very, do, very, do you very have much. any idea why? The moon would have, I mean, it just seems so strange that the moon would have that impact. Do you have any idea why? Uh, if you read a book called Supernature by Lyle Watson, you will, it's a scientist who studied the incredible effect the moon has on humans, the planet, the animals, the trees, everything. Mm -hmm. And there's such a strong connection. I mean, women are integrally related to the cycles of the moon. Mm. through the period mm -hmm. through that monthly cycle and right. you know the more 
you know, when you're really in tune with that monthly cycle and, and so the, the, the moon rotates 28 days on its own axis mm-hmm. and it rotates around the earth 28 days. Right. So both 28, 28. I mean, what are the chances of that? I mean, you know, there's, there's so yeah. many things when you start looking at all this, it's like, wow, wow. Well, that's where you have to start um, discounting coincidence. That's where you have to start saying, wait a minute, what the heck is this coincidence stuff? Because it's just too crazy. It's just and too similar. You know, it, it borders very much on woo-woo stuff. And I can understand yeah. anybody who's going, you going out. But when you really start looking at it, I mean, Lyle Watson, that is a scientist studying it, you know, mm-hmm. um, Supernature. It really is a fantastic book. Somebody who was, wants to get rid of the woo-woo side and start seeing the real effect um, of, of, uh, the moon on humans, your planet. You know, if you ever going to have an operation, Walt, never have it at full moon. You will oh, bleed why? profusely. Oh, really? The bleeding is ex- is known very well in hospitals, etc., to increase um, increase bleeding during that period, hmm. and more difficult to stop bleeding, etc. So when you're cutting open, there's bleeding. So you definitely don't. Um, it's fascinating because my wife is Austrian. Her father um, cuts wood for a living. He has his own sawmill next to his house. And, you know, he gets all these special jobs because people want precision and all the rest of it. So they come to him. Right. They dump a whole lot of huge logs there. And he goes with these saw with absolute precision and cuts them. And he cuts them according to the moon. Mm-hmm. And he, he stores them according to the moon. So even... Even if it's raining and snowing, doesn't matter what it is. If you cut it at the right time, they will dry naturally outside. But if you cut them when it's not the right time, they will never dry and they will crack. <laughs> and it's been known forever. These guys have worked with this since powerful of the horse. You know, it's the oldest thing that they've worked with forever. And nobody questions it. Everybody knows it absolutely works. And I'm on a woodworking forum. And, you know, I've got my woodworking shed. And I'm just right. a whole lot of woodwork today. I'm being building a fence. Um, and the guy was saying, what do I do? All my wood is cracked and all the rest of it. And I said, um, <laughs> I said, said to him, tell, tell me the date you cut them. <laughs> and, uh, the guy was like, what the hell are you on? <laughs> <laughs> and he cut them at almost precisely the wrong moon cycle. <laughs> wow. And they were all splitting. And he said, what can I do? I said, don't cut them during that cycle. He has a website. Have a look at it. Cut them at that cycle. <laughs> Very and, interesting. Uh, there, there's so much involved with it. Um, you know, the moon is an integral part of the entire planet, and us little human pimples of that are, that are <laughs> accumulation accumulation of soil that are walking around the planet. You know, <laughs> that's who, that's all your body is. It's just an accumulation of soil. Pretty much, yeah. Yep. All the, the food you way. eat comes 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 from the soil, you know. Even if you eat meat, it comes from an animal who ate grass. It comes from the soil. So, you know, we are just an accumulation of soil. So we little pimples wandering around the earth uh, with you know we are earth walking around the earth in a different form. And uh I guess I prefer it, the Johnny in- Mitchell version, because the Johnny Mitchell version is that we're stardust. That one sounds more sexy, so I think I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, by the way. Uh, we are stardust. It's just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Stars are burning balls of fire, so we dust a fire. <laughs> That's pretty much it. We're, we are ashes. <laughs> <laughs> From dust to dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Yes, okay, one goes there. <laughs> um, it goes but, yeah, on the, and on. <laughs> the moon has a huge effect. Um, I always wondered about you know, planetary bodies and so forth having an influence because of the whole thing about astrology. And I was never one to buy much into astrology. My sister was really big into it. My mom was really big into it. I've known many other people who've been very big into it, but I could never really get my mind around it, get my head around what, you know, okay, what the planetary bodies have to do with what goes on in your life and what kind of person you are and so forth. But what I've come to realize over time is that, well, I'm still not a fan of, of, um, the whole science, so to speak, of astrology, I at least have a better appreciation because I asked myself a very simple question. What exactly is gravity? 
And when I asked that question really honestly, I had to admit, not only did I not know what gravity was, but science doesn't know what gravity is. And scientists are having a very hard time historically defining what it is and how it happens and what causes it. The most that they can say, the most they've ever been able to say is when two bodies get close to each other, they they have a, a, a pull one on the other, and that pull is directly proportional to the size of the body. Beyond that, they can't tell you what it is. Mm-hmm. And they can't tell you what electricity is either. No, they can't. They can no. tell you how to use it. <laughs> million and one ways, but what yes. it actually is, not sure, really. <laughs> not really, no. Yeah. And, and that's, that, 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 that is the important thing for humans to really get to, is that place and saying, I don't know. Mm. Where do we go when we die? You know? I don't really know. I don't really know. It's I'm theory. not sure we're really going anywhere, to be honest. I really, I really, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, do we really go anywhere? I'm not sure we do, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Come on, Walt, you push up daisies. <laughs> <laughs> Which well, the cow are, eats, and then well, another human eats the cow. And my my so parents are going to have a little run. difficulty with that because they were cremated. So, I mean, they aren't even pushing up daisies. Eh? It's just... <laughs> stardust. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, stardust, exactly. <laughs> we're back to the ashes again. <laughs> Uh, Catholics have got to write, hey, ashes to ashes, dust mm-hmm. to dust. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, I remember yeah. that many times at church. Lots and lots mm. of fun. It is an amazing universe. It is a perplexing universe. It is the one that we know the best. We've been told, actually, people like you who've done astral projection travels have told us that there are universes that have been experienced. And yet, even just the one that we have, is plenty to keep us busy. I mean, it's not like science is exactly. running out of things to do. You know? Exactly. When, you know, when I was chatting to this guy who's astral talking on stage about uh, astral projection, I said to him, why do you astral project? And he was like totally stumped. Nobody had ever asked him that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I was having astral projection, but I, you know, you've got so much to do in this reality. Why do you want to tune in all the other realities? You know, that, it, it might be a bit fascinating and, 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 and all the rest of it, but you know, you've got enough to keep you busy here. You, you don't have to. There's plenty. There really is. <laughs> plenty here. Yeah. 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 Just look at politics or coronavirus. Or <laughs> well, I try not to spend too much time on them, but I get your point, you know, but yeah, I yeah, just yeah. try not to spend too much time there because I don't like to make myself sick. So I try to avoid it. <laughs> well, I, I could talk about it all day. It wouldn't make me sick at all. It doesn't bother me in the slightest. <laughs> Most of the time it doesn't. And that this yeah. is part of the process of becoming that conscious creator is monitoring, self-monitoring, paying mm-hmm. attention to your own How vibration. How do you feel? How, do you How feel? am I feeling moment to moment? Because there are times if I can put too much attention to some of this stuff and start feeling sick. I can start, I mean, I'm not ready to go throw up or anything like that, but I can start feeling that change happening inside of me. And that's the signal that says, hey, stop, don't do this. Go take a break. Get out of that. You're just going to go down that vortex you don't like so much. You heard about this rabbit hole. You don't want to go there. <laughs> and the big key in that whole story, Walt, is conscious awareness. Mm. Yeah. That's I'm really sure what. You can get unconscious awareness, though, can you? <laughs> well, indirectly, I think you can. Indirectly. Because unconscious awareness is making yourself aware. It's not awareness at all, is it? Well, strictly speaking, it's not. <laughs> and if you try to explain it in, term, in temporal terms, it's all going to twist up anyway. But if you try to explain it non-temporally, I think we can at least make some sense out of it. Because we know that whatever is unconscious is simply something that we were formally conscious about that we just kind of put out of our minds. So we can theoretically understand unconscious. doesn't mean that we can actually go look at it because the moment we're looking at it, it's conscious again. So it just kind of (laughs) defeats itself. But we can know abstractly that it's there. And we can kind of play with that too. In fact, we do play with it. How often do people get themselves into that mindset of, replaying old tapes and saying, I didn't do that. That was happening to me. Now, in reality, you and I know, well, yeah, you actually were refocusing on that stuff again, but in the minds of many people, they really weren't. They, that, that was just happening. That was just bubbling up 
you know, from their subconscious mm-hmm. mind beyond their control. You know, so it's, it's like when, when I sit down at the table and uh, my wife brings me a pudding that is gooey and uh, automatically an old program kicks in and I say, ooey gooey was a worm and ooey gooey worm was he. <laughs> he sat upon the railway track, the train he did not see. Ooey <laughs> gooey was he. And of course, my dad said this endlessly. <laughs> well programmed. At the table. And and then again, when 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 my wife drinks something burnt, my dad used to say this: "My wife worships me with burnt offerings." <laughs> <laughs> and and every time I say them, I got this huge, strong feeling like these old programs, these old programs, mm-hmm. these old programs. <laughs> And, you know, they, they're quite fun, and the kids have learned it and all the rest of it. And I think, oh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> I'm programming them now. <laughs> mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if the program is not negative, do I have to worry about it? Well, more precisely, is a program negative? Ah, uh, yes. I mean, if it's focused on what it doesn't want, it is. If it's focused on what you do want, no. So, yeah. Mm. yeah. And that's really the art of conscious creation, in my view, is learning how to take something that I used to not like, that I've turned into a program that continues to play, and find a way to like it, or at least to appreciate it. And in appreciating it, <laughs> it, it transitions. It goes through that little dance we talked about about 10 minutes ago, where all of a sudden there's this shift that took place. Well, what was that shift that just happened? But that's what happens. It, it, all of a sudden, that thing that I used to despise so much, I'm now laughing at, or I'm now perplexed by, or, I, or I'm now thinking like, what was I so excited about? Or you know, something is different in the way that I think about it. And in that mm. something, that in that something of difference, all of a sudden that thing that was so negative isn't negative anymore. Pretty, pretty crazy stuff, but it's cool. And it's a great skill. Absolutely. Yeah. That's one of the things that uh, David Strickle teaches really strongly in his Taya boot camp. It's all about, Gaining that perspective to um, to just feel better about and appreciate the things that were haunting you and may still be haunting you until finally you, they are no you, longer negatives. Do you know what I've been doing recently, Walden? I, I found it had a profound effect and it really shocked me how profound an effect it had on me because it's so simple. Um, you think about the five elements, so air, water, wood, and metal. Okay. So That's I'm four, walking by the in way. the. <laughs> I'll think about the other one. All right. Um, so <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying. I mean, I'm not complaining, Sorry. Randy. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> uh, fire. Uh, we well, so... said that one. That was the Did first I? one. Yeah. Okay. Fire, <laughs> water, air, wood, and metal. That's five. Oh, okay. Now you got five. Okay. All right. I'm sure it's fire I, I left out. Never mind. Um, <laughs> well, that's all right. I was thrown anyway because the one I originally heard was four, fire, water, air, and earth. So, you know, it's, we're close. <laughs> all of them are integral to Mother Earth. Hmm. And when I was going past a tree, I even put my hands together, kind of preposition. I don't know. It seems powerful to me. And I acknowledge the wood. And okay. when I walk past a street lamp, which is made on metal, I acknowledge the metal. And when I feel a breeze on me, I acknowledge the breeze. And when I feel dew or water or drops or rain, I acknowledge that. So <clears throat> um, I just found it really, really settled something inside of me, which I was shocked about. It's like, mm. wow, this is powerful stuff, and it's so simple. And it's just the acknowledgement. Um, you know, I usually only do it when I go to the park and all the rest of it. But if I could do it all the time, my monitor's metal. <laughs> <laughs> um, just well, some of the times I'd be confused because, okay, I have like an LCD screen. Okay, so what is that? <laughs> I'm not sure what category to put that one in. <laughs> I'm sure there's a bit of piece of metal there somewhere. Or... Probably. There's, there's some metal. There's some plastic. There's a little electricity there's some, going on. Some heat, there's, which might be fire. Some heat. Yeah, there's a few <laughs> things. So all of it. We worship. We appreciate all of it. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, it, it was really shocking to me. I really felt a 
deep harmony inside me when I'm doing that. And mm. I'm trying to do it more and more often now. And what do you think? Is, what do you think that's accomplishing? What do you think is happening that, that you well, feel I, is I, making I think, a big shift? You know, everybody says gratitude, but it's mm-hmm. it, it's not bowing down to it or anything. It's just an, a, a level of appreciation of its existence, okay. mm-hmm. um, and it is part of the five elements of the planet, mm-hmm. and it's an integral part of everything. And um, <clears throat> you know how people say, you know, find things to appreciate, appreciate. You know, and you get your list, but you're not actually doing it consciously when you're going out walking, talking, you know. And and this is more a very conscious, conscious thing where you're going out to actually walk in the park and practice Yes. Um, the acknowledgement, really. And you're not bowing down to it. You're not worshipping it. You're not, you know, it's got nothing religious or anything. This is purely, you know, you're part of the earth. Mm. I respect that. And mm-hmm. that's it. Um, and I just found that very interesting, even when you see an ant, which is some of the smallest visible creature, mm. um, you know, it just, in, it's, it's such an incredible creature, you know, how much it can pick up and carry and, uh, um, oh, yeah. just, you know, how, how they march in lines and, you know, yeah. how they tell each other where food is and right. you got the scouts and you, you know, they're just so incredible. And, you know, you feel just going and going and feeding some ants every day will probably be something that I should start getting into. You know, take your food before you eat it. Go outside, find some ants, and give. <laughs> just as an give, exercise, give to the ants. <laughs> give some of the smallest visible creatures on the planet. Just, just giving them for for no other reason than you can. I, I'm actually That's visualizing it from the perspective of the ant. You know, mm. the ant is quite a bit smaller than you are. And so it's there in its own little ant environment. And all of a sudden, this thing goes whoop in front of it. It's like, whoa, what was that? <laughs> oh, you reminded me of a story. Uh, do, I, do I tell it if my sister might kill me? I, ma- I imagine you will, but I won't push it. <laughs> well, I've got one sister who's who's very much into nature and all the rest of it. And I uh, asked her to help me with the maths problem. She was in the study and she was helping me with my maths. And I saw this ant walk past and I took my fist and I went bang and I killed it. And she took my maths book and threw it out the the door and said, get out, you get out, you murderer. Mm. And it, it was quite a shock to me because I hadn't really thought of, it's, I wasn't aware of what I was doing or anything like that. I, you know, I was just born in Africa and, you know, thing bugs were just killed, you know, mm-hmm. mosquito dead, you know, it's just the way it was. Um, and I'd never really thought of it from that perspective. So it was a big wake up call for me, but, um, it, 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 it was something that, you know, has never left me on my mind and my idea of what's right and wrong and all the rest of it. And really I sat there and thought for hours about I'm a murderer. Well, what bothered me more was that I couldn't get any more help with my maths problem. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that is a problem. Yes. <laughs> um, it, but it's you know, it's funny though how uh, we can get into these thought processes because that's what you were in. You were in a thought process. You were you were exploring um, a realm of morality, of ethics, and. Mm realizing, I, I don't know about you, when I get into that mode, and I don't get into it very often anymore because I already recognize where it goes, but uh, when I used to get into that mode, I find really quickly, well, not only did I kill that ant, but a lot of people kill a lot of things for my benefit when I go to the grocery store. And in fact, as I drive along the highway, things fall you know, against my windshield and die. And so I'm killing that way. And you, you can actually get it on a really bad guilt trip just by, you know, playing those scenarios out in your mind. At some point, you have to kind of find another well, way. Well, you really are not allowed to wash your skin because you're killing off. I know, it's bacteria terrible. Bacteria that are, that are living off you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Soap's deadly to them. <laughs> it's just, I mean, but it can drive you crazy. It really can. If, if you let no. it, if you let, if you it, let it, go, it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. if you let it just kind of, you know, take over your mind, it can drive you absolutely nuts. Um, 
It's also one of the reasons why I gave up on ethics as a science, because it's a lousy science. It doesn't work at all. <laughs> no, but what does work, interestingly enough, if you want to replace your ethics philosophy, replace it with the emotional guidance. Yes. Yeah. Now, that is focusing in what is right for me now. Right. Does this feel good? Doesn't it feel good? And then ethics and morals are out the window. Well, you have to be willing to good. let go of them. Because you could, you could still be in the ethical mode and say, yeah, well, yeah, well, it's easy for you to say, but how about that person you're hurting over there by doing that? You know, you can, you can yeah, very easily I, fall I don't back have any of those problems, Walt. <laughs> I know you don't. <laughs> That's their problem. <laughs> That's theirs. That's, but I'm saying one can have that issue. You have to really let yeah, go yeah, of yeah, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I suppose heart. some people can, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm one of them. Um, I, it took me a long time to let go of morality and ethics. I, it, it, that was that was a challenge for me. It was a real challenge. I carried those I was, as high banners for a long time. Massively strongly with, I mean, I was brought up Catholic, and you know, it, and, and a good sense of right and wrong. But it was never there was never a great push or, you know. Oh no, I did it to myself. It or, oh right, I, okay. I I totally did it to myself. I went to school for it. I mean, I, this was me. I, these were right. my choices. This is before I understood the, the importance of individual choice. Mm -hmm. This is what I was doing when I was in college. I was taking courses deliberately to focus my attention and learn this stuff. And it took me many years to kind of let go of the darn thing. <laughs> Realize this is not good for me. <laughs> this is not leading to my happiness. This is leading to my undoing. I don't know why I keep doing this. Yeah. I think it's quite fascinating the whole what is death subject? It's which this kind of is a piece of yeah. It's it's interesting how the design is our non physical part of us. Abram says, now this is what Abram says: the non physical part of us chose to take on a physical part of us and to join together to play with the contrasting universe. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that all makes sense, but how incredible is that sensor that when you're born, all that stuff that you were before non-physical is erased mm. yeah. and how almost impossibly difficult it is to completely open that out mm. and see clearly that we are non-physical mostly, as Abram says. I mean, intellectually, we still get it and all the rest of it, but to be 100, I mean, even my out-of-body experiences have helped me to understand it even clearer than a lot of other people. But still, there's this aspect of, wow, that sensor that cleared all those past lives, cleared everything out. And the only thing you're knowing is this blank slate playing with your parents and the, the, the apples and the trees that, that you're now involved with and, and, and you're all there. It's really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm highly impressed at how well that sensor is like, because if you blew it apart, I don't think we'd want to stay here or be here. We'd see such a bigger picture and everything would be so completely, um, almost arbitrary, <laughs> uh, oh, level of arbitrariness to, to a, when you've got that full picture all the time living with it, that full conscious awareness of everything all the time, the God awareness, um, you know, it, you, you'd not want to stay here. I mean, you know, <laughs> just... Well, I guess that's what the advantage of living in these tiny heads is, you know, when you have this little brain space to work with, you really can't fully grasp and imagine how big the larger part of you is. So you're kind of just automatically cut off from it in that sense. Cut and you're the in the program it. and you're, yeah, you're in it, with right. the program yeah. and it really is fascinating to me. It's, um, it, it's incredible the design, and I agree. It's kind of fun though. I, it's I, kind of... I, I can really feel that. I can feel that I agreed to play this game. You do get that sense of, of the I arena. I do get a very strong sense okay. that uh, you know I agreed to play the game and to have that okay. wiped and cleared and, and 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 to play with us. It's also interesting. Somebody brought up the concept recently that I think from the age of eighty-six. 83, 86, I can't remember exactly. Your life karma, the reason for coming into this life, starts breaking down. 
and you often see quite strong character traits vanish at around about the 83, 86 mm. mark where people start becoming almost, you don't quite know who they are anymore because they, they're not, I remember how much my dad softened as he got older mm, and, yeah. you know, my dad was so strong and, you know, even if he was wrong, he was right. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> he was so, <laughs> so dogmatic and, 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 right. and strong and powerful and forceful. Um, mm. his, his idea of what was, what, what was right and wrong and where, where to go. Um, yeah. <laughs> the stories and visions and come back in my mind are just loads, but you know, he just, he just changed so much as he, as, as he got mm. to, you know, the, that, that round about that stage, it really started breaking up. And I've never thought of, you know, that reason for coming into this life vibration, um, being very strong in the beginning and then starting to wane as you get older. It, it was a completely new concept to me and I'm busy throwing it around in my mind and starting to get used to the idea. Because I'm starting to see with a lot of people, my wife works with a lot of people who um, are dying. You know, people go to the nursing home to die. She works in palliative care. Palliative care, yeah. Mm-hmm. But she can't quite see the difference of what they were like and where they are now. Right. Because she, she just sees now. Parents and she only yeah. sees now. So um, I was trying to get some information from her, but then I started to realize the, the folly of trying to ask her yeah. this because she, you know, um, but maybe asking the siblings, et cetera, um, might get some information on that, but it's just something I wanted to look more at. Maybe somebody else there on LOA today is listening to this show and has got a similar experience and wants to share it. Well, I think we've all experienced that to one degree or another, either yeah. with, you know, parents or older family members or even through our own lives. I'm not sure that there's an actual, age cut off. I mean, your source said that there was one. I don't know about that. I kind of think it's an evolution that happens over time as as we age, as we get older and older. By age, I don't mean uh, old age. I mean, just as we get older, as the years progress, because I see, I, I see myself as being the same person that I was when I was, say, in high school. But mm-hmm. by the same token, I can see a lot of ways that I have evolved and shifted who I am and, and shifted my perspective on things and, and therefore shifted the way that I behave, the way I think about things, the way I experience things. And I maintain that's it's still just me. I, I, mm-hmm. I'm not one of those to say, well, I'm a completely changed person. No, I'm not. I, I, I'm partially changed. I'm also, there's also that core part of me. That's the same core part that was there, you know, 50 years ago. It's still there. The difference is that there's a similarity. That's the difference. The difference that, that most people see is, oh, my God, there's this big shift. Well, okay, there was a big shift, but what's the other part? See, you, you, you made reference to it a moment ago. You talked about, you know, there's that little piece of us here and that big piece of us in the non-physical, right? Mm-hmm. That big piece in the non-physical didn't go through all those little changes that the little piece went through. So that big piece is relatively the same as it was 50 years ago in this non time thing that we call time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it really is not any different. What's changed is, is our experience in, in what they call the ego form, right? Um, the, the physical form. And th- there are shifts and in, in transitions that happen there, but the basic person underneath, I think I maintain is the same person. It's just, we're seeing things different. We're experiencing different. We're thinking about it differently. We are expressing ourselves through our, our physical limited physical consciousness differently. And so in that sense, we seem to be different. We appear to be different. We have different persona from what we had, say, you know, 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 60 years ago. But I think we're still the same person. And because of that, because of the fact that we really are the same person all along, that's why I don't think it's a particular age where it all changes. I think it's a transition. It's a transition that happens through time as we add more and more experiences, as we go down more and more rabbit holes, as we explore different things, as we hang on to different things, you know, as, as we make all the choices of our lives, that is a transition that happens that leads to things like your father softening over time. Um, I mean, in my dad's case, uh, one of the things, it was kind of a little bit a difficult deal with he was always a very active person he ended up getting um parkinson's disease and succumbing to symptoms related to parkinson's he was a very active various person before that and i can even pinpoint where it all shifted it shifted 
when he and my mom moved to the lake where they retired on. It was called Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia. Beautiful lake, by the way, gorgeous. But it had one flaw that they had never anticipated. He didn't have access to all the people he used to have access to. He didn't have his old circle of friends because they had moved away, right? They moved to a different location. And he didn't have a new circle of friends except for some limited exposure, limited contact. The biggest thing that was missing is he didn't have friends who were physically active. Like he used to play volleyball and he used to play golf and he used to you know, do all these physical activities. He and I played tennis. He stopped all of that when he retired, not because he didn't have the physical ability anymore, simply because he had put himself into a new location where he could not easily find it anymore, where it was no longer easily available to him. So he was in this beautiful, idyllic location, but his old things that he loved so much were gone. And I remember kind of pinpointing and cornering him at one point saying, dad, you got to go out at least, you know, do some walking every day. Cause I could see this deterioration that was going on. Mm. You got, you got to, you, cause you, you need to be active. That's the kind of person you are. And he acknowledged it, but you could also tell he was just saying, I don't know where to go do it because we're in this remote rural location where there really isn't a whole lot that you can do along that line. And he wanted to do it with people. He didn't want to do it by himself. And so he stopped doing it. And within a matter of a year or more, it was a very short period of time, he started manifesting the symptoms of Parkinson's. Now, one of the ways to identify Parkinson's disease is what they call the Parkinson's mask, which is where the uh, facial features particularly just turn more into a mask, that the person is much less demonstrative in terms of expressing their emotions as they talk mm -hmm. or as they interact with people and so forth. And that started to happen with him. It started to happen with his whole body. He, he just became a physical person who behaved differently from the one he'd been all the rest of his life. And it manifested. I mean, what's the thing we talk about all the time? How disease manifests, it starts in the mind. It, it begins with the thought. That's what happened with him. I'm convinced of it. Now, I can't convince a doctor of it, but I know in my heart of hearts, he made himself sick by moving to paradise. <laughs> I mean, go figure. <laughs> It's uh it's just amazing. It's just amazing. <clears throat> I'm I'm always a bit concerned when late in life people move. You know, you move to an old age home, etc. But you don't know anybody there. All your friends are where you were and and yeah. all the rest of it. And it's I remember the first dead body I ever saw was my, my grand. She came to live with, live with us before she died. And, um, you know, she walked past my bedroom, gave me a box of Smarties. And a little bit later, my dad called me to the, to grand's bed and said, look at grand. I said, yeah. He said, she's passed away. She's dead. And I said, oh, but she looks like she's just sleeping. He said, yes, that's what it looks like. <laughs> One of the best things my dad ever did for me. <laughs> mm. um, and uh, if anybody thinks that's harsh, it's not. It's one of the best things he ever did for me. Um, it gave me a, a far greater understanding of death and, and a greater perception of it. And, and, and I looked at it, and but I couldn't eat those Smarties for weeks and weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite an experience. Yeah. Well, this has been a very fun experience. By the way, we have a guest coming to join us next week, a gentleman named Ken Dixon, who's a life coach and uh, very much into law of attraction. He's going to be visiting us and talking a little bit of Abraham and a little bit about his uh, seminars and things that he does. So something for us to look forward to. And hopefully Amy will be back. Hopefully she'll have her power back. The people of Atlanta <laughs> will say you can do your podcast again. <laughs> <laughs> but this Amy, has been very good. So looking forward to seeing you again. <laughs> Absolutely. We are definitely looking forward to it. But this has been good. Good conversation. A little bit, uh, we weren't really sure what we were going to do, but we talked about some good stuff. So well worthwhile. So thank you very much, Louis. Appreciate everything that you bring to the table. It makes a great difference to me. And thank you to all of our podcast listeners as well. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, everyone.